Well, I guess since the, that announcement's come on, let me start the session. So uh, the Office of Gender Equity is delighted to co-sponsor with the Office of Faculty Development today's Amplifying Equity Lecture. Uh, let me start out by thanking Corinne Johnson, terrific program manager for the Office for Faculty Development, who will be handling all of today's technical aspects because that's something that I have to hand over to someone who's really expert at it. Uh, and then, then let me introduce myself. I'm Sandy Mazur, and I'm a professor of ophthalmology and pharmacological sciences, and also director of our Office for Women's Careers within the Office of Gender Equity. Just a couple of housekeeping comments to start with. Today's session, as you probably heard, will be recorded and it will be available on our Office of Gender Equity website, along with earlier talks in this terrific Amplifying Equity series. Um, during Dr. Geisler's talk today, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'll be happy to ask them. However, we will also, um, we've left time at the end to open up for live questions uh, about anything that uh, has arisen during the talk. So we would really welcome it. Uh, I want to give you some background for today's session. In March of this year, the journal Cell published an editorial that was entitled Assessing Gender Disparity Among Cell Authors. And they noted in that that when they were looking at the manuscripts they accepted in 2021, only 17.4% were submitted by women. And that this disparity is not new. When they looked over the previous five years, this was not unusual, but it was definitely the trend. And it's worth reading their analysis and their ideas for addressing this disparity. Uh, and I hope some of that will be covered today by Dr. Geisler, but what really caught my eye as I was reading the article was the following sentence. Please invite us to your institutions. And when travel permits, we would be honored to visit you in person. So, you know, you can't put that out there without our thinking, well, this might work for us. So we responded and we were thrilled that Dr. Sarah Geisler, who's scientific editor of Cell Press, accepted our invitation and is visiting us today almost in person via Zoom. So just to give you some background for Dr. Geisler, she trained as a molecular biologist at Case Western Reserve University and also the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. She joined the Cell editorial team in 2017. And as an editor on the Cell team, Sarah handles a wide variety of topics that span the whole scope of the journal. In addition to handling manuscripts, she also contributes to developing the journal strategy. And in 2019, she became the strategy lead for st cells, stem cell and developmental biology content. These are both areas in which Sinai has a lot of strength and I hope this will benefit our, our talking to cell. Uh, Sarah also has a strong interest in advocating for inclusivity in science and has been involved in the Rising Black Scientists Awards since their inception, as well as data-driven introspection of author representation at Cell. Uh, this work is the basis of her talk today, and the talk is entitled The Path Towards Gender Equity and Scientific Publications. Uh, we look forward, Sarah, to learning about the path to gender equity and authorship in scientific journals, what Cell Press is doing to address the gender barriers, and what we can do to get ourselves published in Cell. So again, I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Geisler, PhD today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And thank you so much for, um, for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to share with you kind of the things that we've been, been working on. And so I will share my screen. And I apologize um, if this is a little bit awkward in transitioning. You'd think after being in the pandemic for so long, you would, this would. Probably one more click. 
All right. So can you see my how can you see my screen? Um, so we also see your upcoming slides. So I think you want to switch to just the presentation mode if you can. How does that work? Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. So I I, I kind of feel, um, given the uh, events of this of this past week, uh, it, it's hard not to acknowledge what has has just happened, um, and that with the um, overturning of, of Roe v. Wade, that the the path toward um, equity and the is much more complicated, and the fight for equality has gotten um, harder and um, the emotions are still quite raw, and I anticipate that um, a lot of you are are grappling with this actually um, in your in your practices as well. And so um, I I just felt like I had to <laughs> had to acknowledge that, and and I I kind of feel in many ways like some of what we've been doing. While I feel it's important, it almost feels like a drop in a bucket that has a new uh, large hole drilled in in it. Um, but um, we must we must move forward, um, and I will kind of not digress too much further on that. Um, and so, um, you know, at Cell Press, uh, we are committed to diversity, and we um, you know feel that this is it's important to increase diversity and inclusion in research and publishing. And we're committed to um, elevating uh, people of underrepresented geographical locations, ethnicities, genders, and, and, you know, and other forms of diversity in science. This is something that is, um, is important to us. And um, as, as editors of Cell, our, our role um, in this space is to, is to listen and uh, learn with the intent to understand and educate ourselves on experiences and perspectives. Uh, we want to acknowledge gaps and problems, uh, including our contribution to those disparities. And along those lines, we have done some self-reflection in um, the past couple of years and have put out a, a couple editorials you know, on this, uh, in which I will discuss a little bit more um, in the coming slides. Uh, but we also want to act on information that we receive and establish opportunities and platforms to educate, support, empower, and fulfill um, commitments. And you know, what do we bring to um, this space? Uh, visibility. Uh, we recognize that our, our platform is, is a very visible platform, and we should use it for discussion and dialogue on these topics. Um, and this is something that, you know, in, in recent years, we have tried to um, try to do in, in, a, in a bigger way. Um, you know, we have a commitment to improving diversity in science, um, the peer review process are the front matter of our, um, of our journal uh, for authors, editors, writers, conferences, webinars. Um, and we also we, we feel like we have a, a sense of community and that we uh, we care about the community and we want to um, be of service to the community. We, we are a part of science and need to find solutions to problems where we may be contributing to disparities. And so um, a few of the, the efforts, this is a, a cell press wide effort is that we have, you know, we recognize that invitations to join um, our advisory boards uh, are a form of professional recognition and, and visibility. And as, as a company, we have um, you know, made a pledge to try to, as a long-term goal, reach 50% representation by women on um, the external advisory boards for all cell press journals. Um, but we had a short-term goal um, that by the end of 2020, we would have at least 30% uh, representation. And I apologize that I don't have the stats for what it was uh, before that 2020 goal, but um, you know, as you can see, we we did make that short-term goal of of 30%. And I'd like to point out that at Cell, 
our um, external advisory board is, you know, currently 49% um, women. And so, you know, it was very important to us at Cell that, you know, we lead this, you know, we see our, you know, because we're the flagship journal of Cell Press, we wanted to um, be uh, on the forefront of, of, of that commitment and, and make that, that goal. Um, and, and some of the other journals um, actually uh, are doing better than, than we are um, in this regard. Um, and I think something that is, um, you know, the, the, the few journals that have, you know, outstanding representation, cell genomics and um, cell reports medicine, they're new journals. And so they were able to kind of start fresh and build the advisory board that they really want uh, with these things in mind from the get-go. Um, and I'm really proud of their efforts in this space. And so one of the things that we have thought about um, a lot in, in recent years is representation during the review process itself. And so, you know, we, we feel that a fair review process should include fair representation amongst reviewers. And so in 2019, we took a look at our reviewer pool for the previous year. And this effort was um, actually quite substantial because we, we needed to um, hand curate the list of scientists that we used as reviewers uh, for, for 2018. And that was quite an effort because at the time we, we weren't collecting in an official way information on, on gender. And so, um, but what we found was that only 18% of the reviewers used were women. And that of the, of the men, 67% were working in the United States. And so we, we saw this as, as quite a problem and we reported on these results um, in this uh, editorial in, in 2019, I think it was September of 2019. And from that, we launched an initiative to start collecting data in a more formal way um, by asking researchers to self-identify. So that way we, we could take out, um, in order to do the hand curation, we, um, it felt quite intrusive. We, you know, basically we, you know, scanned websites, we looked for, um, you know, uh, ways in which, you know, the, the scientists themselves were identifying their, their gender. And um, it, it was quite, quite, a, quite an effort, um, but we thought that it was important that the data that we used was actually self-identified rather than us um, kind of manually curating it. And this also allowed us to kind of track our progress um, on, on this front. And so um, in September of 2019, we set a goal of increasing female review representation to 33%. Um, that would be on average one you know, female reviewer per paper. And so why 33%? Um, we looked at you know, various reports on what the representation might be of our community. And it was... Um, it was rather frustrating to try to actually come up with like what a real uh, number would be because you know different um, different agencies and different countries report things differently and the groups of scientists that they that they um, kind of group together to report for a number is, is different from different places and so we kind of settled on 33%, at least being more representative, representative of what we think, um, you know, the community is uh, in, you know, bio, biomedical sciences. And by the end of 2020, we did um, reach that goal of 33%. And so we were quite um, happy about that. And um, the question then is kind of what's next. And for us, you know, that would be improving geographical diversity in our reviewer pool. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, looking at, um, you know, we, we had a over-representation of researchers working in the U.S. And so we wanted to um, diversify that pool in terms of, of geography because, you know, in, um, in 2021, you know, we saw that, you know, we had 43 countries represented amongst uh, our reviewer pool, but 66% of that was, was North America. 
And then 21% was the UK and Western Europe. And we only had 4% of our reviewer pool from East Asia. And that's not fair because we get a lot of science from um, scientists working in East Asia. And so that we didn't kind of stop there. We, we, so we were thinking it, so we are, and we're currently still working on those efforts to um, maintain um, better representation of, of women in, in our reviewer pool. Um, and we wanted to kind of shift our sights a little bit more to some, to another area that was particularly important to, we think our, our community and that's looking at authorship. And so, um, you know, we, we believe that the decisions about what is the most exciting and thought provoking research in the biomedical sciences should be agnostic to the gender identity of our authors. And, you know, kind of looking at those same numbers, we, we estimated that, you know, likely 35 to 38% of potential senior authors are women. Um, and, you know, we're somewhat dismayed by the fact that, you know, only 17% of the papers that we published in 2021 were submitted by women. Um, clearly, there's, you know, then a disparity. Um, and, you know, we wanted to look at the data and that we had available to us um, that was facilitated by that effort to start collecting gender information um, so that we could potentially pinpoint where in the publishing process this disparity is happening and you know where we can do better. And so I took um, a data set of about 13,000 papers. Um, these papers were submitted between 2017 and 2021. Uh, but the majority of the papers were submitted uh, from 2020 onward. And so the reason for that is because that was when we started uh, collecting the, this, this data. But it was kind of retro scripts that were submitted before that uh, because we asked anyone who interacted with our online submission system, either as a reviewer or an author, you know, to um, self-identify. And so then we were able to, for papers prior to when we started to implement that, to be able to have um, um, the gender information for those papers. And something that I should point out here, and this is a, a limitation of, of our database, is that the all of the gender information that I'm going to be um, talking to you about is for the submitting author only. Um, and so that that's important because, you know, a lot of papers have more than one, um, you know, lead author, and we only have, you know, information for the one. And so that is, is, is a bit of a caveat um, for the analysis. I mean, quite often, you know, we have found that, you know, generally the submitting author is you know kind of the 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 most lead author on it but that is something to consider in, in looking at this and so what you know was immediately obvious um, was that the vast majority of manuscripts were just generally submitted by um, by people who identified as, as being men um, we had, you know, across this, this data set, um, almost, you know, 77% of the manuscripts were, were submitted by, by men, 17% were submitted by, by women, and then um, a, a rather small uh, percentage, not quite 1%, were submitted by um, authors who identified as non-binary, and then 5.6% uh, preferred not, not to answer. And I also looked at over, you know, year by year, what, you know, if there were any trends and, you know, what I saw is that there, there was a gradual increase in submissions from, from authors that identified as, as, uh, as being a woman from 
14.9% to 17.8% um, across that, that time frame. So there's you know, some hope that things might be on the, on the upswing, um, barring that the pandemic hasn't derailed that, that progress. Um, but it really showed us that the gender disparity that we were seeing on our final pages started at submission. And so I also looked at what was going on throughout the process and looking at decision points that manuscripts have. And the major decision points that I looked at are, you know, whether or not the manuscript was sent out for review, and then also whether or not those reviewed manuscripts were invited uh, to revise. And so interestingly, what we, what we saw in this data set is that we actually appear to potentially be sending more manuscripts out for review that were submitted by women. So what you're looking at here is something that I'm kind of calling a success rate. And so we saw that, you know, for manuscripts submitted by men, you know, we saw about roughly a quarter were, um, we were sent out um, and that almost 30% of manuscripts submitted by women were, were sent out. Um, we also sent out, you know, more of the manuscripts that were submitted by, by non-binary scientists. And then um, those that preferred not to answer were, were actually right around a quarter. And so somewhat discouragingly though, we noticed that we appear to invite uh, revisions at a, at a lower frequency for manuscripts that were submitted by women. So looking at, at the numbers, we saw that for those that were reviewed, um, you know, third, almost 37% of those uh, were, that were submitted by men, we, we offered, we invited a revision. And then, you know, almost 32% for, for, for women. And so from this, you know, we had um, some action points that, you know, we, we could see coming from this. And so the first thing, you know, that, you know, we felt like we should do is engage with and listen to the community to, you know, better understand reasons why submissions were low. And so, of course, in, um, you know, with Twitter, we, <laughs> we got some immediate feedback to, um, to that. A response and some some answers that you know we found valuable feedback and so um, you know so the, the, the scientist and uh, Carpenter you know she you know pointed out that you know there's probably an element of self selection here and that um, you know women you know know about the systemic bias and and basically they don't want to bang their head up against the wall and you know be rejected over and over again and given that our data suggested that you know their success rates at being um, invited for a revision were were lower you know there's a level of you know I feel like pragmatism here um, and I you know we take that to heart um, there was also a really nice thread from Joy Wu on on this that um, you know I think you know we 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 saw and we listened to. And so some of the um, you know, kind of reasons that she pointed out and what was really nice about this thread is she also included um, links to other um, you know, sources that are backing up why she's, why she's um, you know, saying these things. And it's, it's true that people have looked at these things. And so you know, this bias that you know, kind of males are seen as more competent. And so this, you know, she's citing a, a study that was looking at um, you know, applicants for, for jobs. And so, um, um, you know, faculty candidates and being um, that, you know, those, the, the male candidates were just kind of seen as more competent. And then, um, you know, and this is something that, you know, you think could probably also be factoring in on the, you know, the, the peer review process as well is that, you know, women need to prove it harder or something. Something um, and in order to seem more competent, you know that you know maybe maybe the reviewers are, are harsher on on women. Um, in and I don't I don't want to say that it's because um, there's malintent 
um, it's these unconscious biases that we need to think about. Um, she also mentioned, you know, kind of like the elite lab effect. And so um, elite labs are more likely to um, be publishing at, at, at cell. And those elite labs happen to be in, you know, overrepresented um, with, with, with men. And so, and this kind of also trickles down to, you know, first authors on papers. This wasn't something that we included in our analysis, but, you know, um, Dr. Wu, you know, pointed out that, you know, the first authors of cell papers are more likely to come from elite labs and that um, those elite labs have been shown to train fewer women. And so this kind of then it that snowballs into, you know, kind of future generations as well. Um, she also pointed out funding disparities. Um, cell papers often are quite quite big, quite data rich and expensive to, to, to get onto the editor's desk um, in the first place. And so the funding disparities then would also affect the number of papers then um, that would land on an editor's desk in the first place. Um, you know, she also mentioned uh, domestic responsibilities that women often have a higher burden of domestic responsibilities. And I have to admit, um, you know, I have I have a one year old at home, and um, yeah, I was the one last night up <laughs> with her in the middle of the night when she was when she was hungry. Um, and more often, I am the one. Um, and so that kind of is like, yeah, I understand that. That hits home for me. Um, I recognize that. And so another action point, um, you know, that, that we saw here, um, and this is something that, you know, you know, we were thinking about, you know, when we, when we published this editorial is that we, we should make gender balance a priority in our recruiting efforts. And so I think many um, might not realize that editors do uh, recruit papers. And, um, you know, this, this tweet, which was, was quite, um, you know, quite, it, it has kind of a, a, a stinging kind of feeling about it. Uh, but, you know, basically, um, you know, someone's pointing out like, hey, you cold call, uh, well, now it's cold email, um, you know, people about about studies. And um, why don't you reach out to more women? And, you know, it's true. Um, and so what we would like to do is, is work to democratize knowledge of navigating the route, the publishing process in this. And, you know, I picked out this specific tweet because it's someone who, you know, is basically saying, what? Editors do this? It's like, well, I, this kind of boils down into, you know, this um, kind of a, a culture of, of people being kind of trained in a certain, in certain environment where certain practices are normal and not seen as being um, intrusive in some way, and um, others who haven't had that kind of privileged opportunity to see, you know, how you, you can navigate the publishing process um, in, in ways that make things easier. And so that's also part of what I'd like to be doing here is, is giving some, some tips and tricks on how to navigate the, the process. And so, you know, one of the things that you can do is is get to know the editorial team. Um, so, you know, this is true for Cell. It's probably also true for other journals. Um, but, um, you know, this is who we are. This is the Cell team. Um, we we don't want Cell to be an old boys club. Um, I think it can feel that way. I think especially from from the outside. But, you know, if you if you look at us, um, you know. We're actually mostly women um, on our on our team, um, and you know we we care about about science. We care about you know um, things being a, a more fair playing field. Uh, we are professional editors, um, so this is you know what we do day in and day out. We are not active. Um, 
research scientists, but we were trained um, uh, as scientists. So we do understand the science, um, even though we're not, um, you know, actively uh, participating in it in that in that sense. Um, and this is something that is unique about the cell um, the cell team is that we're generalists. So um, any editor on the team can handle any paper across the whole scope. Um, and that's you know how we we like to work because you know we we see our job as you know kind of you know curating the content of, of our journal and you know, we see our audience as being very broad and we see ourselves as kind of general readers. And we want to, you know, publish science that, you know, is broadly interesting. And so from the start, the editor is someone who is broadly interested in science um, and, you know, could be coming at your, your paper from a very different perspective. And I think that's important to, kind of realize when you're submitting a paper and you're thinking about how to um, talk about the pitch of your paper is that the editor might might come from a different field. And so we want to be accessible. Um, you can cold email us about your work. That's not something that is an exclusive uh, privilege of, you know, um, the, the people that you see as you know big names in the in the in the field or you know anyone can email us. Um, we're open to setting up you know Zoom or phone calls with you to talk about your work. Um, we you know we are quite busy, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that um, we we won't make time for you. Um, we um, and you don't need to have a manuscript ready to submit to to contact us as well. We are interested in kind of hearing about, you know, exciting work, even at the early stages. And so something that, you know, can help you quite a lot is effective communication um, when you're talking to, to us. Um, it, it's very important. It's important to hone your pitch and really think about, you know, what the conceptual message is of your work. You know, when you're when you're talking to us, when you're crafting an email, to, a cold email to send to us, um, or the cover letter of your manuscript, you know, we, we care about the conceptual message first um, before the experiments. Um, and give away the punchline. Um, we are we're, we're, we're quite busy and so, and we see a lot of papers. And so for us as editors, we wanna know first, like why, why we wanna hear about the experiments first. So instead of kind of, this is a, a, a pitfall that a lot of people kind of uh, run into when they're telling us about their work is they wanna start by, you know, just walking us through the figures and what we need first actually is, you know, your, your general elevator pitch to help us know, you know, what it is that we need to be thinking about when, when we're walking through, through, the, um, through the figures with you. Um, so give away the punchline. Um, and also think about why someone in a different field would care about the conceptual message of your, of your work. And by a different field, I don't mean necessarily you know field adjacent i mean think very different um you know if you're um you know uh, uh, if you have a, a neuroscience study think about why someone who's uh, an immunologist might care or think about why someone who is a molecular general molecular biologist should care about your work what is that interesting hook that would get people across a very broad audience thinking about your work and, and lured into wanting to read your paper. Um, so, so questions that you know, we ask ourselves or thinking about internally when we're reading an abstract or a cover letter or, or really when you know, we're listening to a, a pitch from an author is, 
you know, how, how does this change the way we think? Um, you know, and then, you know, what degree of change is that? And is this a change that, you know, would be exciting to a broad audience, you know, and then, you know, kind of, is it surprising? Um, one of the questions when I was a, a new editor, one of the one of when we were being trained uh, to to talk to think about a paper is like you know how how fast is your heart beating? That's actually one of the questions that we would be asked. You know, is like is this are you, ex are you how excited are you about this? You know, and in thinking about whether or not we wanted to send the paper out for review is in reading this did did it get your did it get you going? Did it get your heart pumping and adrenaline? Are you really excited? And like I said, it's it's how you know what is the audience that would be excited by this. And so those are all really good questions. And so the other the other thing is, is that you know abstracts are very important. Um, they are kind of the face of your paper. And it's often the, the first thing that as an editor we will read about your paper is actually the abstract. And so it is you know really important to avoid jargon and and try to limit the number of acronyms and abbreviations you use and you know you, you don't in the abstract you don't need to use a lot of experimental detail and it's it's not so much about you know going through you know experimentally what you did it's you know what is the what's the bigger message and so you know it, you what you should provide is a sense of the state of the field so kind of where does this sit? Um, what are the current major barriers that this is that this is addressing? Um, you know, what's the rationale for the study? Like, I think it, it, it's quite frustrating to to read an abstract and be thinking the entire time, okay, why are they why are they looking at this? Why are they why are they doing why are they doing this? Um, it's it's good to to mention some some key approaches, but in a in a broad way, not with much much detail. We want to know that there's something that backs up, you know, your conclusions. Um, you want to have a summary of the most important findings, and at the end of the abstract, it should be clear. There should be a you know it should be clear what the conceptual advance was, and so. Um, I keep saying conceptual advance, conceptual advance. And so it, you know, what is what do we think about when we think about conceptual advance? And and really um, we we can see we see conceptual advance is is not just being novelty. You know, most papers report something that is new. Um, it, it's really rare if it's a paper that that's really not not um, saying something that's new. Um, it, so it's, it's kind of thinking about it in a, in a bigger way. And we think about conceptual advance is, is relating to how much a study clarifies complex issues, changes our thinking, and opens up new directions. Um, you know, ideally, we want to publish papers that are, you know, almost launching new fields. Um, and, you know, where is this the start of something that's going to be big? Or, or is it, you know, a next step, something that seems like an obvious next step? And so that is, you know, kind of, that's really all that I uh, have prepared to talk to you about. And I believe we've left a lot of time um, for, for questions and um, I'll leave this information up um, in case you would like to 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 reach out to, out to me um, at my my email. Um, I I'm on Twitter, but I'm I'm not that that active to be honest. Um, but um, this is also um, a link to the editors and staff page, so you can we have bios there, and um, you can you know learn more about us there um, as well as um, follow us on social media um, and. Thank you so much. This was just a wonderful, wonderful talk for me. 
And I can tell you that two of your slides could be also uh, given as advice on how to write a grant. Uh, the same issues arise and, and you've, you've put them so well. Uh, and also some, much of what you've presented uh, responds to some of the questions we got earlier. So I'm, I, uh, those of you who submitted questions and you don't hear me ask them, it's because I think they've been answered already. But, uh, and please uh, raise your hand if you do want to um, ask a question and Corinne will unmute you or you can unmute yourself. I'm gonna kick off with a question that I think was not really covered here um, directly. And some, you know, many of our faculty, the majority of our faculty, because we're a medical school with uh, eight different hospitals, uh, majority are clinical and clinical investigators, many of whom were involved with translational work. But uh, the question was how to get published when you are very clinical? What kind of advice would you give to people? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. And so I think, you know, when um, when, when a paper comes in um, and, it, and it's quite clinical, um, it, I mean, a lot of it depends on what, what the subject area is. And kind of we, you know, we're interested in clinical work. We're interested in, um, you know, Pre, the preclinical work as well as, you know, I mean, we have published um, clinical trials. We're not known for that. And most people don't think of us as a destination for that, but we are, we are interested mm -hmm. in, in that space. And I mean, I think, you know, it, we're interested in, I mean, I would say like the best thing to do would be to reach out to us because it, it really kind of depends on, on the situation. And so often, you know, we, if we're looking for kind of new concepts. And so um, I'm trying to think if I can provide like kind of a, a, a hypothetical scenario. Um, we think about things of terms of, is this, you know, is the study proposing a, um, a new angle of attack on a problem? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for instance, you know, um, we found this, this, this factor that could be a, a druggable target in um, mm -hmm. X, you know, disease context. You know, what is the larger backdrop of um, previous targets that have been looked at conceptually? How is this target different? And how would it stand out above others um does it change the way that we think about the pathology the you know the pathological mechanisms of the disease um or potential pathological mechanisms of the disease um you know it, or do we know about a number of factors that are doing something similar and so in terms of like a, a preclinical stage those are the kinds of questions that we would be asking ourselves in, in a paper like that so i don't know if that helps clarify but I mean, you know, clinical work is is quite broad, and so um, yeah. there's lots of um, there's there's lots of work in this in this space. I mean, I think that um, something that we appreciate is that you know, as there are a lot of things that work in mice. You know, we've I, I don't know how many diseases we've potentially cured in in in, in mouse models, and then mm -hmm. you know that bridge to to human it seems rather complicated and difficult. And so the closer that the study is to, I would say like an, uh, a tangible clinical out, outcome is something that would be important for us in thinking about it if it's a clinical paper. So it sounds like in listening to you that it would be really worthwhile to, to get the, um, uh, the elevator pitch and, and then reach out to a cell editor because it also could help you in terms of how to frame the manuscript when you submit it so that it has a good chance of actually getting out for review. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, and the better the elevator pitch is, the easier it is for us to grasp 
you know, how to think about the, the, the paper. Right. So another question is sort of the pre-pro version of, of submitting a paper. Do you have practical, practical, sorry, practical advice for women or minorities when, when having an authorship conversation in the man in actually preparation of manuscript. So that's way before it comes to sell. But do you have some advice to give people on how you you have that conversation? Um, I don't think I have a good answer to this question. So if I under let me let me make sure I understand the question first. So in thinking about authorship and how to weight authorship, you know, the lead authors and first authors and, and who gets what. Um, and I would say that um, as editors, we, we generally don't think about it in terms of, so um, it's, it's not something that would affect our decision to send the manuscript out for review. So generally we don't pay attention to, you know, there's three first authors on the paper or um, how many, you know, co-corresponding authors. It, that's not something that we think about. Um, and so I don't, it, it wouldn't affect our decisions necessarily. And so I think that's why I don't really have a great answer to, to your question. Um, because, you know, we, we do care that off, the authorship is fair um, after mm -hmm. publication. Um, we do get um, involved in our in, in authorship disputes sometimes these things do do happen and so at that time you know we you know sometimes have, have had to think about these things um, but in terms of at the submission level I mean we do want I mean maybe we should think about it more but um, because we do care about things being um, mm -hmm. fair. Presumably also you ask what each author has contributed to the final manuscript. So yeah. that, that would be a place. The, uh, there's another question here about how do you deal with gender equity and feminism being seen as label or propaganda when like when people put in the bucket of, oh, you're one of those. So is Cell now going to be sort of targeted by people who say, well, you're the only reason you care about this is you're feminists and it's really, you know, everything's fine because this is accurate in terms of only having 17% of the publications coming from women. So really a question of how are you dealing? Have you had any accusations from the community as a result of these editorials and your initiatives to try to get uh, more equal representation? Um, I mean, on, there have been some, you know, comments on Twitter, but I think editorially we haven't really um, given them much credence. You know, I mean, people people can say what they what they want to say on 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 Twitter, and I think sometimes engaging with those comments gives them more of a platform than what they need. Where you know, I think you know, often on you know in social media things will fall fall away if they're ignored. Um, and so that's kind of been a little bit of our our mm -hmm. take on that. It's it's um I, we haven't had a lot of backlash okay. in that regard. I think we've had a lot more positive comments uh, mm -hmm. about about our efforts and um, I think you know as as editors we we care first and foremost about the science. And um, that's you know what we think about what we think about most. Um, we're very confident that you know we're not going to see a, a slump in the quality of our submissions. Um, um, and you know we um, you know that's yeah. my feeling. So uh, Carol Horowitz, our dean for gender equity. Carol, please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, this was a, a really wonderful talk, and I, I, I particularly appreciated using iMessages 
or we messages from the point of view of cell that we need to think about our role and what we can do because we hear too many passive messages in this space. I did want to ask you, um, it sounds like where you are right now is there's twice as many reviewers that identify as female as there are first authors that identify as female. And one of the things that we struggle a lot with, um, whether we're women or people underrepresented in science and research is kind of the idea of taxation without representation. Yeah. So, you know, what do we get for reviewing? Maybe we get to learn more about how to write papers, but, but what do you do about that imbalance that there's more reviewers than there are first authors? And, and, and how do you all decide who you're asking what for? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. And um, that's something that, you know, I think um, was a worry of ours. And that's also why we um, didn't shoot higher. Uh, we didn't shoot for 50% because we felt that wasn't fair. Um, you know, we, you know, that's just, yeah, that, not fair at all, right? And so um, we, the, the benefits of, of reviewing, um, you know, we, we get this all the time because, you know, we, we realize that, you know, we're, we're asking you to do something for us. Um, we're not paying you. And um, it's kind of this, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work as well. And so um, something that we, we do is we, um, we do invite, often invite reviewers to to write previews on papers that they reviewed for us. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, we see that as, as a benefit, but I know that that's just, um, that's kind of a, a, a drop in the, in the bucket, right? And so these are things that- well, we It would be interesting to track representation of those invited ones and, and how you're, how the, how the gender breakdown is in that area. That's, 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 that's a really nice compliment to it. Yeah, so, so you're talking about who's invited to write a preview in the mm -hmm. gender balance there. Yeah, that's something that we track and I don't have the, the data on that, but that is something that, because we have control over that, that's something that, you know, we're not at the, the mercy of what's submitted to us in, in that regard. And so when it comes to, you know, most of our, um, you know, what we call our, our, we call it front matter, your reviews, perspectives, uh, primers, things that are of that sort, we are commissioning that content. And the representation in that sense is actually is a lot better. Um, and when we have when we have control over that. And um, yeah, so I, I, that's, that's, that's a good point. I would say like, a, you know, I am curious for your 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 take on kind of, you know, what we can do to um, recognize reviewers um, in, in, in ways. And, you know, I think this is feedback that, you know, we need to be able to ride to, um, to the company. Um, and so if you have some ideas, you know, feel free to, to email, email me about that. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you have your hand up, please. Thank you. That was a great talk. I appreciate it. Um, I had a question at whether the reviews at Cell are author blind, and if you know, can you comment on that practice? Basically, reviewers have having no idea who the authors are. Yeah. So this is something that you know we think about. Um, uh, we have thought about, and so basically the um, <clears throat> the reviewer it's it's only it's I guess single blind. So the reviewers know who the author is. Um, but the author doesn't know who the reviewers are. And so um, in, in our process. And so we have thought about this. Um, and I know that I think, I think nature has done um, kind of pilots where they gave um, authors the, the option of being um, anonymous to the reviewers. And so, I mean, what's kind of interesting about that is you, you have to write the paper um, often in a very different way because you're, and try to write it in a way that you're not building off of your previous research because then it's kind of quite obvious who the author ends up is. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to say something that's not accurate, um, but I, I don't, I don't, because I, I would say I don't know what the outcomes were uh, from, you know, nature, you know, trying this out. Um, but it's, um, 
I, I had the impression that, you know, the, the outcomes weren't a whole lot different, but I don't know if, I don't know if they had, you know, necessarily the right sample sizes to be able to, you know, be able to do like a gender analysis of that kind of thing. And I'm sure they, I don't think they've done that. I, I don't know, but it's something that we've, we've, we've thought about it. Just, we also kind of realized that the paper would have to be written um, with a different narrative. Along the lines uh, that some journals, one of the paper I recently submitted the, uh, and another one I recently reviewed, I was given the option of my name being associated with the review. Uh, and that was a very interesting reaction on my part in terms of I still was going to say the same things, but I was going to be a little bit more positive in how I put them. Mm. Uh, so I was wondering if that's something that Cell has considered doing and whether there's a benefit to it other than my own personal reaction. Yeah, I mean, this is something that um, we do think about. Um, and there, we, if, if, if a reviewer would like to openly identify themselves, we don't have, uh, we don't have any problems with that. That's up to the reviewer. Um, and so I think, um, and that does happen sometimes. Um, and I, it's a, I think what's, an awkward dynamic about it is when some people do and some people don't, when some reviewers do it sometimes and not other times, it, it, we, we would prefer probably that it was a, you know, a consistent choice. Um, and we do have reviewers that, that do that and we don't shy away from using them because of that. Um, but you know, I have you know, talked to um, authors about you know, how they felt about that. You know, I happened to be at a conference where, you know, someone, I handled their paper and one of the reviewers revealed their identity and they just felt really uncomfortable about it um, because I think it's just these odd power dynamics of like, well, what do I do with this information now? Are they expecting a, a pre quo quo if it was, if it was positive? In this case, it wasn't a positive review. And now I don't really know what, what to think. And, you know, and, and it's, um, so it is, it's an interesting um, space. And I, and I think we as editors also realize that um, behind the scenes and outside of, you know, our communications, um, reviewers will review, reveal their identities as, as well. And um, I, I think that, I don't know, personally, I feel like it would probably be an easier space to navigate if it was all one way or the other. Um, because of, of all of that. But, um, you know, we do feel that it's important that reviewers, no matter what stage they're at, that they wouldn't be putting themselves in a place where they could be retaliated against because of a negative review. And so for us, you know, we, we feel that giving anonymity is important because of that. Um, and so it's hard to figure out how to navigate that. Um, I mean, I, you know, nature has the option of once a paper has been published, mm. that you can, mm. that the reviewer can choose to identify themselves um, mm. at that at that point. And so, if the paper is being published, it's generally probably not going to be. Um, it probably didn't have a negative review process. Um, and so you're, you are kind of enriching the pool for, you know, positive interactions that you had with people. But I mean, I, I think there, there can be value in that, um, you know, in that, you know, often reviewers will provide, provide, you know, really constructive comments that help shape, help shape the manuscript. And maybe an author wants to be able to thank them for that um, contribution to their, to their research. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of, you know, all of the papers that didn't make it, you know, you, you don't have that information of who the reviewers were um, in those cases. But. Thank you so much, Sarah. You really fulfilled the goal of, of telling us how you're working towards gender equity at Cell and also what we can do to get published in Cell. I cannot thank you enough. This has been wonderful. I think I speak for everyone here. Uh, at least I feel like I can at this point, but 
because nobody has uh, disagreed with me <laughs> so far, but it's it's been just wonderful. And uh, I look forward to this conversation continuing. So thank you very much. And thank you everybody who joined us. I hope that you will follow through on Sarah's suggestions and use her uh, advice to not only reach out to sell, but uh, in, in publication in general, because if we don't share what we're learning, then uh, we're really wasting a uh, major opportunity and, and what's critical for what we're doing in our laboratories and our investigations. So thank you very much. We're taking the summer off from uh, our Amplifying Equity uh, series. This was a great way to end. So we'll see you all in September, I hope. Thank you again. And thank you, Corinne, for handling everything. <laughs>